This is God's day. It's a good day, so let us rejoice. My name is Kim Gilliland. I'd like to welcome you to our online worship at Cotton United Church. And as we always say, our uh, worship in person happens at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. You're welcome to join us. Please do if you're able. But we're always glad to see you here as well. With that in mind, let's come to God. Let us sing praises to God. Let us worship God with gladness. The love of God is eternal. Complete in us, O God, the work which you have begun. Would you pray with me, please? Let's pray. We enter your presence, O God of grace, and bow down within your holy temple. Your love and your faithfulness rise through the ages. Your name is supreme among all names. Answer us as we call upon you, O God of creation. You are faithful to fulfill the promises that you have made, and so we lift up our voices to praise you and give you glory, honor, and blessing. Come down from your heights and care for us. Redeem us in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to be uh, looking at uh, Jesus' story of the salt and the light. This actually is going to be... Uh, one of those rare financial stewardship sermons that we need to give every now and then. We don't do it often, but uh, last week the finance uh, uh, committee was looking at our finances at the end of the year, and we realized that, uh, hmm, we've got a zero balance in our operating account, so maybe we need to think about that and do something about it. So they asked me if I'd just share a sermon on a message on stewardship and what that means for us. So we had a deficit last year. Uh, we started off with some money in the bank, not a lot, but enough. And But over the year, that dwindled down so that we ended up with a zero balance. And that's where we stand at the beginning of 2023. We need to talk about that and we need to fix that. But to do that, let's ground ourselves in Scripture. Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see the good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Great story of Jesus. Great words. So, first of all, salt and light. What is salt? Well, a lot of people consider salt to be a spice. But it's really not. Because spices come from plants, and salt does not come from a plant. Salt comes from the ground, or salt comes from the oceans. It's all around us, actually. In fact, salt is not a spice. Salt is an ionic compound called sodium chloride. And now you've had your science lesson for the day. <laughs> we use salt sometimes as a spice to flavor things. But even more important than salt's ability to flavor things is salt's ability to preserve things. We have refrigerators now and uh, we get uh, things shipped in, fresh fruit, all, all year round. Uh, so we don't need to be as worried about preserving things. But and our ancestors would preserve meat, beef, pork. With, uh, with salt. And uh, my ancestors in Newfoundland who worked the uh, fisheries, they uh, every year uh, sent shiploads of salted cod back to Europe to be used there. So salt isn't so much a spice as it is a preservative. It keeps what we've had. It keeps what is good. It keeps things good. And what about light? Well, light shows us the way. If we don't have light, we can't see. If we don't have light, we can get lost. If we don't have light, we can trip over things that we can't see. Now, I know some of us can trip over things even if we see them, but at least if you have light, you know what you're tripping over. And sometimes I do that too. The church is called to be salt, and the church is called to be light. That's what Jesus said. What that says to me is that the church is called to preserve those things which are good. So this, with, as salt, we preserve that which is good. 
but as light, we show the way into which, which show the way into where things could be. So our vision comes from the light. Preserving what is good comes from the salt. Showing the way into the future is the light. Jesus calls us to do those things. He said, you are salt and you are light. Do that, not just in the church, but in your community. Well, how does that relate to finances? Let me ask you this. Where do we get salt? Where do we get light? We get salt typically from the grocery store. And to get salt, we have to pay for it. And we get light from our hydro utilities. And to get light, we have to pay the utility bills. So salt and light we get because we pay for them. The same is true of the church. If we want to be salt, if we want to be light in our community, then we have to be able to pay those things that need to be paid so that we can be salt and light. I want to share a couple of principles with you right now. The first one is this. We need to pay not for what we have, but for what we want. We need to pay, I'll say it again, we need to pay not for what we have, but for what we want. What does that mean? It means that we need to use our resources to fund things that will help the church grow and be a better witness in our community. We need funds that will help us to build more programs, more Christian, Christian education opportunities, to increase or improve our, our, our music programs, to fund a family minister, a new one. We need to be able to do those things. But to do those things, we have to pay for them. And it's one thing to say we want those things, but if we can't pay for them, we have to ask ourselves, were we really serious in the first place about saying we want those things? Here's something that's true. If you want to know what's important to people, don't look at, listen to what they say. That's important, but it's not the only thing. And don't necessarily rely upon the organizations they belong to, because that may or may not reflect what's really important to them. If you want to know what's really important to somebody, check their bank statement or their credit card statement. Because where people spend their money in our society is where they find the most important things. And the church is the same way. If you want to know what's really important to a church, don't look at its doctrine, don't look at what it says, don't look at its mission statement, look at its budget. Because where we spend our money tells us what's really important. Jesus was right. In Matthew 6 and 21, he said this, Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where we spend our money indicates where our hearts are. I want to share a story with you. It happened to a church not too far from here. They um, had a pipe organ. And the pipe organ just deteriorated to the point that it was no longer fixable. But they'd always had a pipe organ, and they wanted to have another pipe organ. So they raised $250,000 to buy a refurbished pipe organ. That's a lot of money. In fact, that was more than your annual budget. And you wondered how they'd pay for it. But they always had a pipe organ, and they wanted to have another one. It took them 18 months to pay for that pipe organ. Good for them, you might say. Yeah, it's really quite amazing when you think of it. Again, it, that, that pipe organ costs more than your, the usual annual budget for everything else. And they got it paid off in a year and a half. It's really quite amazing. But the problem is this. What their goals said, what their mission statement said, is that they wanted to increase their ministry to young families, youth and teenagers. They wanted to attract those people into the church. How many young people and youth and young families do you think are really interested in listening to 18th century classical pipe organ music? How many people do you think that's going to draw young people to the church? You guessed it. Not very many. As they were trying to, as they were raising money for the pipe organ, they also had a goal of, of hiring a part-time youth pastor to help to create programs and draw these young people in. 
But over that 18 months, they couldn't raise enough money for the part-time youth pastor. So what was really important to them? What they had or what they wanted? There was no salt there. And it seems as though the lights were all turned off. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Pay for You need to pay for what you want, not just for what you have. The second principle is this. Mission does not follow money. Money follows mission. What do I mean by that? What I mean is this. Don't just look at doing mission according to what you think you can afford. Think about the mission you want and then trust God to provide the resources to fund that mission. Mission does not follow money. Money follows mission. If you have a good mission, a godly mission that God wants you to do, God will provide. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything. Don't just pray and say, okay, God, you know, provide this. You go out there inspired by God to do the things you need to do to make this mission work. A prime example is our Kiev Home Project. Last year this time, we had no idea there would ever be a Kiev Home Project. It wasn't on our radar at all. But now, we have pretty well finished building a brand new house here in Cottam that's going to be transitional housing for two families, initially refugees from, from, from Ukraine. The house is almost done. And we may be welcoming families as early as end of February or early March. That's an incredible mission. If we had said initially, gee, we can't afford the million dollars that's going to take to build that house, we would never have done it. But we had a mission. And God provided. Sent craftsmen to us, donations, um, uh, tradesmen who... Uh, got their, their stuff, you know, volunteered their labor. Suppliers gave us free materials or highly discounted materials, got grants and all kinds of stuff. And we trust God to continue providing for that mission. We're salt. We're light. That, that heave house is salt and light. As salt and light in our community, we preserve that which is good but we also encourage the community to reach out in a new direction to see what it could be, to light the way for a better community. Last week, I talked about the difference between an institution and a movement. What we discovered was that it is far easier to fund movements than it is to fund institutions. People get all excited about new missions like the Kiev House, like our prayer garden in the side yard. They get all excited about those things because it's a clear difference, a clear way to make a difference in the lives of people. It's visible, it's tangible, it's right there. That's exciting. It's far more difficult to fund the institution. It's far more difficult to raise money for salaries and hydro bills. They're not nearly so inspiring. They're not nearly so, so exciting. But they still need to be paid. It's harder to get those dollars, but we still need to pay for those things. And that's where a current shortfall happens to lie. We have money for the key votes. We still need money for salaries and hydro bills. We have a zero balance in our account. And that being said, we're not in danger of closing. We're not in danger of being bankrupt. Uh, but what our treasure is doing is borrowing from some other funds to pay the operating funds, to pay the operating costs. And we need to stop doing that because we have to pay back those other funds as well. And that's what this is about. That's why the Finance Committee has asked me to give a short message and asked you to consider increasing your gifts to the church. Now, maybe you're maxed out. Maybe you can't give anymore, and, and if that's where you are, then thank you for what you, you, you give. Everything is important. Your offering is important to the work of the church. But sometimes people can give more. They've had a, a windfall, or they've had a raise, or something's happened, and, and they have a bit of extra money. Or maybe the kids have moved away and no longer are dependent. That, that's free, that can free up a lot of money. Anyway, 
whether you give a one-time donation or uh, a monthly increase in your donations, that would be great. But the Bible has a concept, a couple concepts that I want to talk about. And the first one is that the Bible talks about a tithe. The tithe is an interesting tool to think about as we think about how much we give for our church offerings. The literal tithe is 10%. But I'm not a literalist, and I'm going to tell you what I think that is, how that's helpful for us. You can give 10% of your take-home income. That's fine. And if you can do that, God bless you. But it's not necessarily that you, you can do that or want to do that. Ruth and I, in our family, we do tithe. We, we take that literal number, and, and we have been able to, to give our tithe to the church. But that's our goal. It's not your goal. There's a couple of important points here to the tithe. The first one is that tithing talks about proportional giving, whether it's 10%, whether it's 1%, 3%, 5%, 20%. You get to choose what percentage you want to give the work of God. The interesting thing though is that most people don't even know what proportion they give already. If you ask the average churchgoer how much they give to the church proportionately, they'll say, "Sa, we think we'll give about 3%. In fact, studies show that if they actually look at what they give of their take-home pay, it's actually more like 1.7%. So it's a bit more than half of what they think they're giving. And that sometimes surprises people. But it also gives them a goal because they think, okay, I thought I was giving 3%. I'm only giving about half of that. Now, how do I get to that 3%? Because maybe that's the proportion they want, that they want to give so that they too can be salt and light in our community. So here's a question for you. What proportion of your income do you want to give to the work of God in the church? That is completely up to you. There is no right or wrong answer. But what do you think you would like to give? And that's the important part. What proportion would you like to give? And once you decide that, you think, okay, am I there? Check out, check things out. Are you, are you where you want to be? If you are, God bless you. Sometimes Some people get surprised and find out they're, they're giving more than they thought they were going to give. They give a higher proportion than, the, the, than they thought they were giving. But if you're not giving as much as you'd like to give, how do you get there? When Ruth and I were first married, I'll never forget, my father-in-law, Bernie Wiseman, he was a minister. Both Ruth's parents were ministers. And he was a literalist, so he believed in giving that literal tithe. And he always said to me, Kim, I'm, I'll never forget him saying, Kim, if you give the Lord his 10% his tithe, then you will never go without. And then we listened to that, and we kind of grabbed onto that. And Ruth and I have found that to be true in our lives. But when we first heard him say that, we were nowhere near 10%. We were actually about 2%. And we tried to get to that 10%. And it took quite a while. But every year we, uh, because you have to rearrange your finances and you have other bills that are there that you have to get paid to that aren't going away. So how do you do that? Well, every year we would increase our givings by half a percent. On a good year, it was 1%. Maybe even on a really good year, 1.5%. Until eventually we got to that literal tithe and we've been able to maintain that ever since. But again, that's our goal not yours. Whether you can give five, three, two, one, whatever you can give, all your givings are appreciated. The interesting thing is that uh, as your income goes up, your tithe goes up. As your income goes down, as, as mine might next year when I retire, then our tithe goes down as well. The important thing is that we're not asking, in tithing you don't commit to a particular amount you commit to a particular proportion, which you should be able to afford. That's the first thing, proportional giving. The second thing about the tithe is it's also very intentional giving. You, you plan, you choose how much you give. And it says in the Bible that we should give from the first fruits of our labors. That means that our tithe should come off the top. Rather than rummaging through your wallet or your purse on, on Sunday morning, wondering if you can find a bill to put in the plate, and who has money in their, who has money in their wallets these days anyway, if you decide how much you already want to give, and you do that through a, a pre-authorized giving like PAR, or you, you send it through on it, or you write a check, or whatever you want to do, 
you get your, your proportion there. You get your tithe there. Same thing with your insurance or your uh, medical bills or, or your telephone bill. It comes directly, a par will, will come directly out of your account. So you don't need to worry about it, just there. It, it goes out. And it's intentional light and it's intentional salt. So what about you? What is God laying on your heart? Are you able to help the church out a bit more financially? If you can, thank you. If you can't, then thank you for what you're giving already. It doesn't matter if it's a big amount or a small amount. Even little amounts, many little amounts add up and make a significant difference. Well, friends, that's where we are. And that's what we need. May we continue to be salt and light in our community as we seek God's will and Jesus' direction in our ministry. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, you are in our world. You are in our communities. You are in our lives. You are in our hearts. You are in every moment of every day. We thank you for your constant presence. We give you praise, honor, and glory. You are with us in laughter. You comfort us in our tears. You lift us up in times of pain and offer us the healing protection of your enfolding wings. You come to us in love, and we return to you in love. Although we have received our salvation by faith and not by works, it is a comfort to know that you care about the things that we do for others. Enable us to always do all that we can for others, taking full advantage of every opportunity to be an example of your love and character. Thank you for your unconditional love and unfailing promises. We lift up in prayer those who are sick at home or in hospital this week. We remember especially John, Carol, Mark, and Ron. Bless them as you have blessed us all with your healing and Holy Spirit. God, you are our Heavenly Father, the one who nurtures and supports us through all of life. It is our desire that we may always willing, be willing to follow you, your leadership and instructions, regardless of how it may appear to others. Help us to have courage and strength to go anywhere and do anything that you ask of us. May we go without hesitation or reservation, confident that all things will happen according to your great purpose. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, amen. Now, you who are salt and light, go out there, preserve what is good, light the way into the future, and be the hands and feet of God. Until we see you again, go in peace.